Now, when we consider the parables, we need to remember that when, when Matthew and John write in their accounts, they write as eyewitnesses. When we read parables in the book of Mark, uh, Mark wasn't there. But what he has done is taken notes as Peter would deliver a sermon or, or teach a lesson and things like that. So, so they're the recollect, recollections of Peter, but uh, Mark is the one who wrote them down. And today's parable, though, is, is from Luke, who came at it from an entirely different direction. And, and Luke described himself uh, not as an eyewitness, but he was hired by a man to investigate all of these stories by a Greek man by the name of Theophilus to investigate these stories, track them down, talk to the eyewitnesses, and put together a report. And in fact, I heard this week the stat that of all the New Testament writings, the writings of Luke make up the majority of the New Testament. 28% are found in the book of Luke in Acts. Paul's letters take up about 24%. So most of what we have in the New Testament comes from from Luke in his investigation. So we have to assume or deduce that when Luke writes about a parable, it's because people are still telling this story. It made such an impression on them and, and such a valuable lesson in it that people were still sharing it. It was still being told. And a lot of times, maybe it's because these stories that Jesus relates in the form of a parable, they're, they're told out of a context of, of everyday life, just that first century Palestine setting. And this is the story that Luke found being retold that we're going to look at today. It comes from Luke chapter 11. Begins, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. Maybe it's a place he went frequently or a place that the locals knew. For example, if I tell my brother in in Beaverton, Oregon, about Lizard Butte, he has no idea. He knows it's a, a certain place, but he doesn't understand that it's a landmark over here. So one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and the disciples were waiting on Jesus. They're waiting for him to finish. They're close enough to listen because when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples. This isn't all that long after John had been put to death by Herod. I thought this morning as I was praying and studying and, and thinking, I have never lived in a world without prayer. We haven't. I don't know what it would be like to, to go to my rabbi and, and say, I watch you praying. I want to be like you. Teach, teach me to pray. And the Greek word that, that Luke uses here um, is a lot like teach us, but, but I would like the way that the Greek um, puts these thoughts together. The Greek word that he uses means cause us to learn. And I think that's a fascinating spin on that. Cause us to learn how to pray. Because the disciples, and they know this is a, undeveloped part of my being. If I'm following the rabbi and, and he's called me to follow him and this is part of my education, I recognize that this is an area of major importance. I'm ignorant and I need to build this skill into my life. Because if I don't know, I can't do. If I don't know how to pray, I can't be praying. They were a little insistent, it, it seems, and, and they were passionate about it. And if John could teach his disciples to pray, Why can't Jesus teach me to pray? And they'd seen his prayer life. It was a regular practice. And again, if the point is to be like the rabbi, teach us how to pray. And they don't ask for Jesus to teach them a prayer, something that we could recite again and again and again. Wasn't that at all? Teach us how to pray. When we start any new uh, sport or activity or discipline, we always uh, start with the fundamentals, don't we? How many of you took piano lessons? Where did we begin? We began with middle C, didn't we? 
That, and that was, that was where we begin. This is where the fundamentals are built from. This simple understanding that this is the middle. This is where it begins. There's no sharps, there's no flats. It's right there. You won't have to worry about the black keys for a while unless you're really creative. So Jesus begins with middle C. This is what he says. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. And in Luke's account, in, in this story, this is where the prayer ends and the parable begins. And Jesus illustrates a principle of prayer that he wants his disciples and, and followers like, like us, like you and me, to understand, to adopt, and to make part of our prayer practice. So he shares a story set within the common life of the people and the residents of, of a small village in first century Palestine. Now, according to the Jewish Talmud, which is an uh, ancient compilation made up of two things, the Gemara and the Mishnah, two law documents that come together into a book called Talmud, which explains if God says this is how it's played out in practice or you know, this is how we operate on a Sunday. This is what we don't do. This is what we're allowed to do. It gave the whole explanation, but in the Talmud, it had a portion in there, and I looked for it, that talked about the, these two villages just outside Jerusalem called Bethpage and Bethany. And these, the only reason it showed up in the Talmud was because these people were widely known for a reputation of hospitality. They were over-the-top welcoming to anybody. So Jesus tells a parable that fits this particular context. Jesus said to them, this is right after he's taught them middle C. This is what he says. Jesus said to them, suppose you, or actually in the form of a question, he, he would ask, who among you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. Now, for, for us, we're not getting out of bed, are we? We're not going to answer the door. We're going to call the police. We're going to see what's going on, or at least that person would have called us ahead of time. But in their world, in the, in the village of Bethany, where the last time that we see Jesus in Luke's account, this is where he is. He's in this little town about a mile and a half outside Jerusalem. This probably happened all the time. I mean, they have this reputation for hospitality. Uh, it's a world without cell phones. It's, it's a world where you can't estimate how long it's going to take you to get from A to B. You'll have a rough idea, but depending on the heat of the day, a lot of people chose to travel at night or in the evening. In our context, we don't know how long it's going to take us to get through road construction these days, right? So you can't say, I'll be there at a certain time and then actually show up then. So in Bethany, nobody has raised eyebrows over people that show up in the middle of the night. This is not a deal. And when they arrive, whether, whether you're friend who's traveling has eaten supper or not, the practice of hospitality dictated that you offer him something to eat at the end of their journey. That was the practice. He could show up at two in the morning. You're still having a meal for him. And poor families who didn't have leftovers um, would go knock on the neighbor's door. And the neighbors would share Again, in Bethany, this is not a, it's not a thing. It's just regular practice. Not that unusual at all. And you have a sacred obligation to provide care for the travelers. Plus, this guy that's traveling, he's your friend. Then Jesus says something that completely shocked the people that he's talking to. They would have thought this was just outrageous. He says, so 
He's knocking on your door. He's asking for bread. Suppose the one on the inside, this friend, answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and get you anything. The friend has been making excuses as to why they're not going to, going to help. And the listeners to Jesus' parable would have thought, this would never happen. Are you nuts? This isn't who we are. Of course we would get up. They're thinking the opposite of what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, no way I'm getting up. I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. Seriously? Do you know what time it is? How dare you? Go away. But that's not what Jesus' listeners are, are, are thinking. They're thinking, of course you get up. It's what we do. Are you kidding me? I can't even fathom the idea that this guy wouldn't get up and help. Of course your friend is going to get up and help you. Jesus, this is a stupid story. My friend won't complain. He won't start making excuses. In fact, he will give me more than I ask for. He's just that way, and this is just what we do. Refusing to help somebody knocking on your door at midnight, that's not even a thing. This was preposterous. You're knocking on your friend's door, and he's offering excuse after excuse after excuse, but number one, that wouldn't happen. But, but let's say it does happen. And you still need bread. Your guest still needs to eat. You still need to provide hospitality. If he's not motivated just out of friendship and hospitality and our city's reputation, what's the next step? Jesus says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, you know, like we all know he probably would, but isn't doing it here, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you not just three loaves, he'll give you whatever you need. He'll give you the keys to the bakery if that's what it's going to take. even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Shameless audacity. I've never wanted to be known for shameless audacity before. I know that there are carriers of that virus in the world, but but uh, I don't want to be that person. But this, this is part of middle C. This is something that is so important that Jesus builds it into this foundational message about prayer, and it shocked me to death. In King James, the word that's used here is importunity, which means persistence, especially to the point of annoyance. You bug the guy who won't get up until you make a pest of yourself. The Greek word, and I'm going to mess up the pronunciation, is anideia, which means without shame or unembarrassed boldness, yet in the dignity of faith. Isn't this amazing to look at these three things? Shameless audacity, importunity, and anadea as part of our prayer life. In this parable, Jesus, Jesus seems to tell us that the need that we present in prayer is going to be met for one of two reasons, because God is a good God and is our friend, or because I refuse to leave until he's helped me. And don't forget, this is a parable about prayer. When we pray, Jesus seems to be telling us we're we're to ask without shame, with unembarrassed boldness 
It's, it's not about, oh, that's uncouth behavior, that's unbecoming, that's bad manners. <laughs> it's about the shamelessness of a faith, trust, filled believer that God is going to do something on our behalf. A believer who is not halted by human fear or what the rest of the crowd might be saying. He will continue to pray shamelessly and boldly in faith. Even when others say, oh, you're over the top, you're a little too extreme. That's excessive. Mind your manners. That kind of faith. We have a story in, in Mark's gospel about that kind of faith. And it looks like this. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city of Jericho, a blind man, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. <laughs> oh, the shameless audacity, right? Look at what it says next. Many rebuked him. Told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more. Unembarrassed, unembarrassed boldness to the point of annoyance. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man. Cheer up. On your feet, he's calling you. Would we know the name Bartimaeus if he had stopped shouting? Shouting without shame, with unembarrassed boldness would we know his name the likelihood is he would have died unknown poor and blind back to the parable Jesus said so I say to you ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and the door will be open to you for Everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We just sang it. He's a good, good father. God wants us to, to be constant in prayer, to be diligent in prayer, to ask with unembarrassed boldness, with audacity. We're to ask, we're to seek, we're to knock. And we're not to be put off when the answers seem in our perfect worlds to be slow in arriving. But we're to continue praying. Like the man at the door who needs the three loaves of bread, he just continues to pound. Because the answer's coming. We're to be persistent to the point of annoyance. God isn't put off by that. I, he rather enjoys that. He's pleased by it. The early church father, man by the name of Tertullian, observed that persistent prayer is a violence pleasing to God. I don't know that I would have ever looked at it that way. But I think it's important to note. See, this isn't a parable that teaches us how to manipulate a friend who's reluctant to help us. It's part of the first instructions to the first disciples and the first followers in how to pray. And these first things that we are taught, whether it's a skill or a discipline or our prayer life, 
these first things taught have to become the cornerstone to the prayer life that's going to take us through life and right up, right up to the gates of heaven. We're to pray with shameless audacity, persistence to the point of annoyance, and unembarrassed boldness. Back to that last portion. If we then know we are imperfect, yet still know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Father, a good God in heaven, give the Holy Spirit to those of us who ask him? It's not a question. It's phrased as a question. What it really is is a promise. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and it will be given. Jesus says, my prayer, our prayers will be answered one of two ways. Uh, First and foremost, because he's a good God and loves giving good gifts to his children. He knows how, at just the right time, in just the right way, he knows how to answer that prayer despite my timeline. And that's where the rubber meets the road. Sharon and I knew a a lady back in Salem who had prayed for her husband for 40 years before he came to faith. That's a long time. We never know the moment that, that God is going to act on our behalf and answer that prayer. We have to be diligent. We have to be insistent. See, the the other component to God just being good and and answering that prayer, because he's good, is because I am refusing to stop asking until his answer comes. We've raised kids, haven't we? When they were young, sitting in the back seat, the perfect little angels that they were, they would ask to the point of annoyance, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? How much longer are we there yet? But you know something? Every one of them eventually did arrive, didn't they? shameless audacity find a way to take Jesus sense of urgency and his sense of unembarrassed boldness with you into your prayer world your prayer life and don't grow weary in doing good let's pray Father you know me you know my nature you know how I I just laugh out loud at some of the parts of these parables. How the people of of Bethany were so different than the people of Arthur Street. How they were known for hospitality and in our world we, we kind of aren't. Sure, we're generous, but we would not think of knocking on our neighbor's door at midnight. Father, thanks for the lesson that that teaches us in itself. But Father, we really thank you for the message in this parable about how persistent prayer is so necessary. It's good for us. It's good for those people in situations that we pray for. It reinforces the necessity of patience in our our life, in our world. God, we are so thankful that we can seek and find. We can knock and the door is opened. We thank you for that promise. We thank you for the privilege that we have to, to pray. As I mentioned earlier, just the fact that we have not known a world without prayer is such a blessing. Father, help us 
we do ask that you would send us more of your Holy Spirit to continue to shape the way that we live and act and have our being in this world. Father, that the Holy Spirit would lead us into areas where we can make uh, changes where change is necessary. Father, where we can become more like Christ, and where we can affect our communities and bring the gospel to bear in every single home in Caldwell. We thank you for the privilege that is. Father, we come to the table this morning asking that you, as we take the bread and the juice, would remind us again of the cost and the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf to reconcile us to you. Every prayer we pray, Father, because of Christ's sacrifice, doesn't have to pierce a veil of any kind. It goes directly to your ear. Help us to understand the privilege that that is and also the weight of responsibility to pray for our lost world. Father, we thank you for this spectacular day. Be with the people that are traveling or vacationing. Father, give them rest, relaxation, and Father, bring them home safely. We thank you so much for your goodness to us. We pray this in your name. Amen.